us tonight to serve you. And I would just want that heavenly sound, Jim, listen. The heavenly sound, not too much strings. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven. For things that could not satisfy. But one day I heard a blessed Master Jesus speaking. He said, Draw from my web. We've come to do it again, Lord, that never shall run dry. We've come to the well tonight here in our crowd. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I walk. Tonight, Lord, fill our hearts anew, fill our cup again, empower us one more time to live the Christian life as we should, as we must in these last days. Magnify your name tonight as you bless your people with a fresh anointing from heaven, a fresh infilling from above, in Jesus' name. Meet every need, answer every prayer, hear every cry, grant every need, in Jesus' name. We give you the praise. Amen. God's people said, can we give the Lord a mighty hand of praise? You may be seated. We are truly in the presence of the Lord here. Blessed Jesus, we worship. Blessed Jesus, we honor you. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and unending mercy. I'm so amazed, you know, by the presence of God here that he would see fit to come and dwell among us. Only Jesus. Sweet Jesus. Can we just look up and say, thank you, Lord? Just look up, look up and say, thank you, Lord. A million thank yous. 
Never leave me, never forsake me, never leave any one of us. And when you're displeased with us, don't look upon our sin, I pray. Don't look upon our weaknesses, I pray. See, see the work of Calvary. See your love and grace. See the blood you shed for us. See our hearts. For you know we are only dust. You remember we're only dust. Thank you for your love. You know what our frame. He remembers we are dust. Thank you, Lord. I want you tonight I want you tonight to go to a blessed scripture with me from Romans chapter 6. And Jim, the Holy Spirit is so precious and so present right now here. What a fitting song you're playing. How we need a fresh and filling. I'm going to read from Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not? That so many of, of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. How true. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. These are powerful words. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, likewise. But we pay attention here now. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Now this verse is very powerful and clear. It says that we as believers have authority to say no to sin. That ye should obey it in the last thereof. So we have the power to say, no, I will not let you reign in my body. Because I died with Jesus. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. 
as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now, the reason I read this portion of Romans 6 from verse 1 right through verse 14 is because I want to explain something to you very important. Jim, I thank you, and Mark, thank you. And I want everyone to pay close attention because we are in the presence of the Lord, no doubt. We can sense his wonderful presence and touch. And I believe that every word tonight that God will speak to us will go deep in our hearts. So tonight I want to deal with something very important. How do we embrace the cross of Jesus? Because what this says here, if you really pay attention to it, I'd like many of you to go back and reread it when you get home. It talks about the fact that we have died with Christ. We identify with his death on the cross. But what does it mean? What does it mean to embrace his cross, to identify with his death, so we would live free from sin and the bondage of sin? Now, first of all, we have to understand where we stand legally, our position in the sight of God. Very important. Our position in the sight of God is the way God sees us. God sees us. Not the way we see ourselves. That's our condition. I don't want you tonight to look at your condition. I want you to look at your position. Because your condition will depress you. Your condition will not cause you to rejoice. Paul, when he saw his condition, he said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this condition I am in? Wretched man that I am. He was talking about his condition. But tonight, I want you all to focus on your position in the Lord, the way he sees you because of, of the work of Calvary, where we stand legally in the court of heaven. Because when you stand in the court of God, he sees you differently. That's why it says there is therefore now no condemnation. Because before the judge of heaven, we are not under condemnation. We've been delivered from condemnation. Now, I'm going to say a lot of things to you tonight. I pray that the Holy Spirit will help you hear it and retain it. Lift your hands and ask him to help you hear it and retain it, to remember it. Okay. I'm going to... I'm going to make it as simple as I can. When you read the book of Hebrews, the book of, of Hebrews gives us the Old Testament, basically. And it speaks of Jesus, what he's done for us, greater than what the law had done for Israel. The the. The book of Hebrews was written to Hebrews or Jewish believers who were under persecution. To be under persecution 2,000 years ago means that nobody would hire you and give you a job. To be cast out of the synagogue or the temple meant you are looked upon as a sect or a cult. On the Roman law, 
2,000 years ago, anyone who was a Jew accepted by the Jewish authorities was protected by Rome and seen as a religious group under protection. But the moment an individual walked away from Judaism and was declared an outsider by the Jewish authorities, then he or she was seen as someone involved in a cult or a sect. And therefore they lost protection from the Roman authorities and were persecuted. Persecution in those days meant that anyone who would help you would be punished. Anyone who would give you food would be punished. Anyone who would give you shelter would be punished. Anybody who would hire you to do any work would be punished. So you lost not only your position as a Jew, you lost everything. Your family could not help you or associate with you. Nobody would give you food. Nobody would hire you or help you or give you shelter. So the early believers, having seen the difficulty of their persecution, wanted to go back to Judaism, and that's why the book of Hebrews was written to them. So the book of Hebrews was written to individuals. That's why it's called Hebrews, the book to the Hebrews. So when you read, for example, Hebrews chapter 6, or Hebrews chapter 10, that talks about if you walk away, there's no place for repentance. It, it was talking about apostasy. Jews that went back to Judaism and said no to salvation in Christ. The book of Hebrews used to trouble me, especially when I would read Hebrews chapter 6. That if we tasted the part of the world to come and sin, we would be cut off. If we sinned willfully, we'd be cut off. And it began to trouble me because I'm thinking, well, now David sinned willfully. He looked at Bathsheba and desired her and made a decision to kill her husband to have her. That's, that's willful sinning. All right? Are you, are you all listening? Yeah. Because we have been taught and we have believed that we believers cannot sin willfully. We only sin because we are weak. Well, David sinned willfully. But yet God forgave him because he was predestined to be among the righteous. God will not forsake his inheritance. You are his inheritance. You are his treasures. You are his jewelry. The Bible makes it very clear. We are his treasured people. That's what the word peculiar people means. Say after me, I am his inheritance. I am his treasure. And I am his jewel. In Malachi, it says that we are the jewelry of God, his jewels. But the Bible says in the book of Psalms, the Lord will not forsake his inheritance. Say, he'll not forsake me. So when, when you, as a predestined believer, now, can you go a little deep with me? Can you handle a little meat? Okay. Now, I'm sure you heard of predestination. Predestination means that God predestined you to be his child before the foundation of the world. So if, uh, Ephesians 1 is predestination. He chose you before the foundation of the world to be his. And Romans 8 talks about predestination. But predestination is not predetermination. Can I say it again? Predestination means you have a choice to say yes or no. So the Lord chose you before the foundation of the world, but you have to follow him. He will not force you to follow him. Am I making, am I getting through to you? Because some people believe in America and here too, that once saved, always saved. 
that's not in the Bible. What the Bible teaches is that we have to follow the Lord. Now, the difference between the devil and the Lord is quite simple. Satan will push you, Jesus will lead you. So whenever you, you feel you're being forced and pushed, that's not the Lord. Because Jesus gives you the choice to follow or not follow. So he said, follow me, then you make the choice to follow. Or you make the choice not to follow. But anyone that has any wisdom will follow. As like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. So we make that decision on our own and we have to follow the Lord and work out our salvation with fear. That means the fear of God and trembling. And I'll explain that in a moment if I have the chance. Now, but I must say something very, very clearly. The book of Hebrews was written to tell the Jewish believers Jesus is better than Moses. He's better than angels. He's better than the law. The new covenant is better than the old. And all it said is, stay, be patient, don't leave, keep walking. The reward is on the way. That's the message of Hebrews, basically, to Jewish believers that were being persecuted and rejected by their own families and nation and friends for being believing believers in Christ Jesus, Jewish believers. So once you, you understand that only apostasy cannot be forgiven, apostasy means you make a willful, knowing decision to forsake Christ Jesus. Come and understand. Put your hands up high. So the whole book of Hebrews was written to keep them from apostasy. Is that clear so far? So please understand that in your own eyes, in your own eyes, you, when you see your condition, you see your sin. You see the flesh. You see your wretchedness. You see how you cannot live the Christian life by your own strength and power. So you have to come to the place where you embrace the cross. You have to come to the place where you cling to the work of Calvary. Because on your own, you cannot make it. The cross is our strength. The cross is our protection. By identifying with the death of Jesus, we receive his life. And that's what I just read in Hebrews. So sin will not have dominion over you. What does that mean? It means God gives you the authority to say no. You are a predestined people. You are a chosen generation and a royal priesthood and a holy nation. You are God's inheritance, God's treasure, and God's jewelry. God will not forsake you. God will work with you as long as you allow him to. He does not give up on you easily. He does not forsake his own. He looks to save and keep his own. He's the one who goes after the lost sheep. And all he looks from you is your willingness to follow. Your willingness to say yes. So the Christian life, you've got to hear this part now. The Christian life is not about trying. It's about yielding. Can I say it again? The Bible doesn't say try to live the Christian life or try harder. It says yield your members as instruments of righteousness. Do not, I just read it, don't yield to sin, yield to righteousness. So my job is simple, 
yield. What does that mean? It means I cannot live the Christian life, but Jesus can. So let him live his life through me. And all I need to do is let him. All I need to do is yield my life to him. Yield my body to him. And, and yield my will to him. Where I say, Lord, I cannot follow you. Please give me the power to follow you. I cannot love you. Give me the love I need to love you with. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. He's the one who gives us love for Jesus. He's the one who gives us the will and the desire to follow him. Nobody can surrender to the Lord on your own. You have no ability to surrender to the Lord. But the Holy Spirit gives you the will to surrender. And the strength to surrender. It took me years to learn what I'm telling you. Years ago, it began with a man named David Duplessis. Maybe many of you have never heard his name. How many have? Very few. The old timers are still here. David Duplessis was from South Africa. He was used by God mightily around the world. We called him Mr. Pentecost because he brought the Holy Spirit to millions. So every, you know, everyone called him Mr. Pentecost. And I looked up to him. I revered that man. And one day I had the privilege to meet him. I was 20... Three years old, maybe 24. I was invited to preach at a conference in Brockville, Ontario, by a lady named Marty Phillips, who was the Catherine Kuhlman representative to Canada. And she was my friend. I began preaching when I was 21. And Marty Phillips heard about me and came to our meetings and told Catherine Kumar about me. That's how the connection all came together. And Marty invited me to speak at the conference, and David Duplessis happened to be one of the speakers. And then Marty Phillips said, would you be willing to walk him to his room? I said, absolutely. I jumped on the opportunity. And I'm walking with him. He was a short man. He always carried a white or beige briefcase, and he always looked down to the floor and walked like that. He didn't even look at you, he just walked like that, very slowly. So I walked with him, and I'm thinking, what can I ask him? Well, I, I may never have the chance again to walk with such a man to his room. So the question I had for him, I said, Mr. Pentecost, imagine calling a man that, but that's his name. Mr. Pentecost, I said, how can I please God? And he put his briefcase down, and he pointed his finger at me, and he put his finger in my chest and pushed me to the wall of the, of the, of the hallway. And here I am with this man with his finger in my chest, and he looks at me and said, don't try I just said, how can I please God? He said, do not try. It's not your ability. It is God's ability in you. And then he picked up his briefcase and said, good night, and walked away. And I'm still at the wall wondering what he said. I'll never forget that night. I'm stuck at the wall wondering what he meant. And all he said was, don't try. Don't try. Well, I'm here to tell you, don't try. You will not win or succeed by trying to live the Christian life. He said, don't try. It is not your ability. Now say with me, I will not try. It's not my ability. 
And then he said, it is God's ability in you. Say, it is God's ability in me. Now, this is what I'm talking to you about tonight. Yield to the Lord. So think about that was when I was 23 years old. I'm 71 now. Well, thank you very much. But it took years before I could grasp what David Duplessis said. He, he, he went to heaven years ago, years ago. I never got the chance to go back and ask him, explain that to me. Because he was an old man by the time when I met him. But God showed me what he meant over the years. That the Christian life is not about try or try harder. Yield. Surrender to the Lord. Let him live his life in and through you. It's so simple. E even a child can yield. A baby can yield. So simple. You sat on a chair tonight. You yielded to the chair to hold you up. Nobody here turned the chair upside down to, to make sure that the, that the legs are, 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 are tight, that, that they're solid, they will not fall, and you will fall with the chair. That's called faith. You sat on the chair, and you didn't bother to make sure that the chair can hold you up. You just sat down, believing that chair is strong enough to carry you. Why don't you have faith like that in God? If you have as much faith in God as you have in the chair, you'll, you'll, you'll shake the world. You yielded to the chair tonight. You surrender to the chair. We surrender to the Lord. We simply let him live the life in and through us. I know that is difficult for some people to comprehend because you must become a child to surrender. You have to be a child in the spirit to surrender. And that's why Jesus said only children will enter heaven. Why? They must be simple. We have forgotten the simplicity of the Christian life. It's so simple to believe. It's so simple to trust God. When people go swimming, if they relax, they float. If they struggle, they drown. So it's not time for you to drown. Stop struggling and start floating. Just yield to the Lord. Relax, relax. Trust Him to do it. Look. You did not find him. He found you. And since he found you, he's going to keep you. You did not save yourself, nor can you keep yourself saved. Trust him to do the job from beginning to the end. He that hath begun a good work in you will finish it. Just trust him to do it. Now, you're going to say, well, I'm a sinner. God knows that. God loves sinners. You say, well, I have, I have weaknesses. That's all right, because Adam gave that weakness to you. It didn't keep God from loving you and saving you. You say, well, I have problems. I have all kinds of things in my life. God knows all that, and he loves you still. So... God is going to do the job, and all you have to do is yield. Say one now. Yield. Now, I'll give you something else to think about. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me, and I abide in you, and you'll bear fruit. Now, if you look at, at a vine, without the branches, it disappears. If you ever see a vine with grapes... If you take the branches, you have nothing left hardly. So Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Without the branches, you can't see the vine. So what is my job? Get connected with him. Stay connected to him. In other words, hang in there. 
Don't walk away. Just stay in Jesus. So simple. Stay a member of the family. So simple. So simple. So how do you stay in Christ? Well, keep his word in, in your heart. Because if you keep it, it will keep you. When the word of God is in you, it will keep you in Christ Jesus. There's power in scripture to keep you in Christ. You need to keep the Bible in your heart. Lord, it says, David said, I have hid your word in my heart that I'll not sin against you. So if the Bible is in your heart, all is well. And then you ask the Holy Spirit to make that word alive, to make that word live. And he will reveal Jesus through his blessed word. And then you talk to the Lord. Any relationship will, will die if you don't talk to, some, to somebody. If you're married, many of you probably are, if you don't talk to your, to your wife, your whole relationship will die. Or you don't talk to your husband, that, that whole relationship will collapse. Communication keeps the relationship alive. So talk to God. Talk to him every day. When you get up in the morning, say good morning to him. When you go back, to, when you go to sleep, say good night. When you're hungry, talk to him. When you're thirsty, talk to him. When you're in trouble, talk to him. When you're in the highway, talk. When you're in the car, talk to him. Sing to him. In the shower, bless his holy name when you're taking a walk. Just talk to him. God is not religious. He's God. People are religious. But God is not religious. He's God. He is so wonderful and beautiful and real right down to earth. Jesus rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. And he shows up in the upper room. And the first thing he says to his apostles, I'm hungry. That's real. That's the living, blessed, real, down to earth Christ Jesus. God Almighty. Just being raised from the dead. You think he would come with some spiritual whatever. He said, I'm hungry. You've got food around here. That's my Jesus. That's your Jesus. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and say, I love you, Lord. That's him. That's his love. That's his reality. That's its simplicity. Precious Lord, precious Savior, he walks with you and talks with you and tells you you are his own. Hallelujah. And all you have to do is keep talking and walking with him. Keep his word in your heart and don't forsake the fellowship of the saints. How simple is that? Very simple. Very simple. Now, since I've said all this to you and I hope you listen to what I had to say. Just stay connected, abide in the Lord, all is well if you abide. But if you walk away, you're in trouble. Outside Jesus is sin. Outside Jesus, devils. Outside Jesus, darkness and confusion. In Jesus, there is light. Glory, beauty, and blessings all the time, every day, all the way, throughout eternity. And when this world will fall, will fall apart, you will not fall apart. Because no power can defeat you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. No, no power can defeat you. You cannot be defeated. You are more than conquerors. But for you to live the Christian life, the flesh has to die. The flesh has to die. So what did the Lord say? He said, okay, if you want to make it, deny yourself. Carry the cross and follow me. But what does it all mean? All right, we're going to get into it now. Are you ready? Yes. I said, are you ready? Yes. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I'm ready. Yes. I'm going I'm to talk to you about what does it mean to deny self? What does it mean to embrace the cross of Jesus? That's what I'm talking about. The cross is not about a past experience. We take the cross with us all the way. All the way. Now, we're going to get a little deeper. Are you, are, you, are you able to go a little deeper, okay? So, book of Romans. Let's talk about the book of Romans. The book of Romans can be divided into four different parts. And if you get that, you'll really get the whole message. 
From chapter 1 to 5, it's about justification. I'll explain that. F chapter 6 and 7, sanctification. Chapter 8, glorification. And then 9, 10, 11, and, and 12, uh, sorry, 9, 10, and 11 talks about Israel, God's plan for Israel. But your part is really four parts. There's really five parts in the book, but you take 9, 10, and, and 11 out because it doesn't deal with you. It deals with the Jewish people. But the fourth part is from 12 to 16 is your duty as a believer. So let's go through it again. From 1 to 5, justification. 6 and 7, sanctification. 8, glorification. But then from 12 to 16, my duty as a believer. But if you want to put all five together, the five parts, well, include Israel in it then, which probably will help you anyway. So one to five is justification, and six and seven, sanctification, and eight is glorification. Nine and eleven, God's plan for the Jewish people. And then 12 to right through 16, my duty. How do I live as a Christian on this, on this planet, in this world? But let's, let's deal with the first three parts that I think are very important. From Romans 1 to 5, I'm justified. But what does it mean to be justified? So what is justification? And what is sanctification? And what is glorification? It is very important to understand these things. Am I saying too much too fast? Good. I'm going to keep going. Thank you. To be justified means that my sins before I was saved... Before I was saved, I was guilty. Before salvation, all of us were under condemnation and wrath. We stood guilty in the presence of God. And then, then we came to the place to say, Lord, I give you my life. At that moment, he forgave you your sin and forgave you your guilt. I'm going to come down right now. I need to really look in your eyes. And I need to say a few things to you and ask you a question or two. Okay? So, when I talk and when the Bible talks about justification, you, know, you can see me on the screen so you, so you don't have to see me. Like, all right. So, when the Bible talks about justification, it talks about my guilt in the past is forgiven. That's mean that, that that's what is meant by justified. Now, many preachers have taught that justified means past, present, and future. The Bible does not teach that. No. Justification deals with the with the past only. My penalty, the penalty of sin is gone. I'm born again. God declares me righteous. That's what justification means. But then I have to work out that life. So God declares me righteous. Now I have to work into that righteousness by following the Lord, by cooperating with the Lord, by receiving his word by talking to him, by listening to him. And from day to day, I am changed and transformed into his image. That's called sanctification. And that releases me from the power of sin. All right? So when, when you got saved, you were free from the penalty of sin. God forgave your guilt the penalty of sin was removed. Now you live the Christian life. You obey the Lord. You follow the Lord. You read his word. You pray daily. You talk to him. You're working it all out. And as you are living the Christian life, you're working into that righteousness God declared you in now. And that takes all your life. So God declares you righteous in a second. 
you're justified in a second. But you have to work it now. And it takes life, a whole life of yours, before you come to that place where you will not have sin controlling you. So I'm free from the penalty when I get saved. But as I live the Christian life, the day will come I will be free from the power of sin. So the longer I live, the less sin controls me. The longer I obey, the stronger I get. Are you listening? Yeah. And then slowly I become stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And sin becomes weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. But I'm not free yet. I'm not free yet from the presence of sin. Until Jesus comes. And when Jesus comes, he will liberate you from the presence of sin. So there's three things when it comes to sin. There's the penalty of sin. Gone behind us. Forgiven. There's the power of sin. The power of sin, as I live the Christian life, I overcome it by the Spirit. And then there is the presence of sin. That I will be free forever when Jesus returns. And that's what the book of Hebrews talks about. But here's here's how we begin. Here's how we begin. I'm going to ask you a question. But I want to remind you what it says about Abraham. It says Abraham believed in God. He believed in God. And God declared him righteous. Now, many Christians today don't understand what in God means. So what they believe is, well, they say, I believe that, that, that Jesus came. That Jesus died for me. That Jesus shed his blood. That Jesus. Jesus rose from the dead. That Jesus is coming again. Well, that doesn't help you. Because that, that, that has nothing to do with anything that God will do in you. So the devil says, or unbelievers even say, well, I believe that Jesus came. So does the devil. I believe that Jesus died on the cross. So does the devil. I believe that Jesus shed his blood. So does the devil. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. So does the devil. I believe that Jesus will come again. So does the devil. But he does not trust the Lord. To believe in Jesus. In Jesus is the key. So, so let me ask you a question of you. Do you believe I exist? If you do, put your hands up high. Fine, fine, that's, that's good. Now, how many of you believe in me? Oh, only those who are nice believe in me. You, oh, oh, wait, 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 you cannot believe in me. If you believe in me, give me your soul to keep. That's it. If you believe in me, give me your money to protect it. Did you, did you get that? You changed your mind. One more time. I changed my mind. <laughs> it's a, one, wonderful. Because you cannot believe in a human being. Because to believe in a human being, give him all your money to protect it. Or give him your soul to keep it. Only God can be trusted with my soul. Are you getting it now? If you are, wave at me. All right, you cannot believe in a human being. You can believe that, that, that human being is a good man, and whatever that, that, that is. So the world believes that Jesus came and died and rose. Well, so what? But they they do not believe in him. To believe in him means, Lord, I give you my life. I give you my soul to keep it. I give you my money and everything. I give you all I am and all I have is yours. So Abraham believed in God. Genesis 15. He believed in God. And God said, since you trust me, you're righteous. 
He did not have to obey the law. There was no law to obey. He believed in the Lord. And God said, I declare you righteous. That's what salvation is. You believe in Jesus. I just happened to notice this little thing flying all over the place right here. Wow. This is high tech here, brother. <laughs> high tech. Looks like a little helicopter flying in the air. Okay, now, are you with me so far? Yes. Okay, so you are already in Christ because you believed in him. Comprende? Okay, fine. <laughs> you speak Spanish, some of you are good. So this is important. So now we come to that second portion, sanctification. So I believed in God. He declared me righteous. I'm in the kingdom. My sins are passed and washed away, and I'm free and redeemed. But that does not guarantee I'm going to enter into heaven. I have now to work out my salvation. How do I do that? That's what we are going to talk about now. So we have to understand the cross now because it's the cross that brings me into that sanctification where sin will not have dominion over me. And I read earlier Romans chapter 6. So in that portion that you can read for yourself later, but I'll just point some things out. This internal portion is about sanctification. Remember Romans 6 and 7, sanctification. So in Romans 5, he begins with, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Fine. Then chapter 6, he begins to talk about, now shall we continue in sin? No. God forbid. Because we are dead to sin. We already believed in God and that sin has no part in our life. He said, don't you know now that you are baptized, you're baptized into the death of Christ Jesus? Aha. So now sanctification begins with death. Death to self. Prior to that, I was alive. But I didn't know I was really dead. I was alive to sin. I was yielding my members to sin. And one day I said, Jesus, I'm tired of my sin and I believe in you and I need you to save my soul and save my life. I give you my life and all that darkness and all that wretchedness and all that bondage. I give you all of me. And he saved my soul. And now he declares me righteous. And now he says to me that if I identify with his death, I will walk in newness of life. That's powerful. In verse 5 he says, if I am planted in the likeness of his death, I'll be resurrected in the likeness of his resurrection. So he begins talking about crucifixion in this chapter. In verse 6, don't you know you're crucified with him? That you should not serve sin and so on. Verse 8, don't you know you're dead with him? Don't you know that Jesus dieth no more? And death hath no dominion over him? He died unto sin once, he lives unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. All right. Now, Lord, how do I do that? Now, Jesus said something powerful. In Luke 14, 27, in Luke 14, 27, he made a powerful statement about death, about death, that we need to die to the world. 
and the things of the world. He said in Luke 14, 27, whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You can't even be a Christian without carrying the cross of Christ. And then he said, which of you intending to build a tower sits not down first and counts the cost? So, salvation is more than a free pardon for the past. Salvation is more than pardon from my past sin. Because salvation deals with the temptations that come from within me, that stay with me. It's the power of God that's keeping me. Say, I am kept. Lift your hands, say, I'm kept by the power of God. Now, when you think about the, the demonic forces without and the corruption within, how can you keep yourself? You cannot. There is a demonic hurricane happening around you all the time. There's corruption within you more powerful than a hurricane inside your soul. Paul talks about that war within, between flesh and spirit. It's a war raging in the soul. I live in Florida. I used to live in California. We had earthquakes in California. We have hurricanes in Florida. I'd rather have the earthquakes than the hurricanes. Now, in that hurricane that we went through twice now, I've been living there since 2020, and I've gone through two, two hurricanes. I did not like it at all. I live by the ocean. Those waves were massive. We had to evacuate. In fear of flooding, the winds were ferocious. Now, had I had somebody given me a candle, a lit candle, and had that candle stayed lit in that hurricane, I'd say, that's a miracle. But the winds were so fierce, they would have blown the candle and me with it. There's a candle inside of you. There's a light within you. And the forces outside of you and inside of you are more powerful than any hurricane. And the light is still shining in you. If the light of a candle would stay shining in a hurricane, I'd say there's power in that candle. But there's a storm around us and a storm within us. But the light inside of our hearts is still shining. Why? We are kept by the power of God from the storms of life without and the storms of the devil within and the flesh within. If I took that candle and went swimming in a pool or the ocean and that candle stayed lit under the water, I'd say, that's a, that's a miracle that that candle stayed shining even under the water. We are surrounded today by evil powers. We're surrounded. We are literally surrounded by the demonic and the world and the corruption outside and the corruption inside. And the light within us is still shining. Why? We are kept by the power of God. Lift your hands and thank God we're kept by His power. With, uh, listen, with the storms around us, nothing can, can put that light out of us. To Him be the praise. I said, to him be the praise. I said, to Jesus be the praise. Take your seats. I am. We have to die to self. But what does death signify? What does the cross speak about? You see crosses over church buildings, you see crosses as necklaces where people wear them. But they, and we forget sometimes, what does the cross represent? The cross 
has to do with the execution of a criminal. The cross is about death. Today we would compare the cross to an electric chair or a hangman's rope in some countries because it represents death. We have to die to the things of the flesh and the world. Jesus said, deny yourself. But what, what, but what does it mean to deny myself? There are priests, there are people that in the past would go and live in a cave in my part of the world, not wanting to be a part of the world. They go choose some monastery or a cave in the desert. That's not going to help you. There's only one way to deny the flesh. One way and one way only. Lift your hands and pray in the Holy Ghost out loud. Come on, all of you. Hallelujah. Lord, open their eyes. Give them spiritual understanding in the things of the Spirit. Give them wisdom. In Jesus' holy name. The cross represents shame. A few years ago, I've always loved history. Always loved history. I could have told you more about the Second World War than anybody could have told you. I would sit with my staff after the Crusades for hours and give them details of history about the history of the Middle East, the history of Britain, the history of Stalin and the Russian czars, and you name it. What have I gained from it? Zero. I've always read the Bible. I've always loved the Bible. I've always lived for the Lord as, as long as I can remember. Even, that, even when I lived in Israel, I was so religious. I was in church every Sunday as an altar boy. I didn't know, know the Lord then, but then I got saved when I was 19 years old. My whole life is involved in one way or another with the work of the Lord. Even before I knew him, I served him as an altar boy in church, carrying the cross behind the priest chanting in Greek, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. And I'm the little kid back there that was choking with the incense. <laughs> I never missed church when I was a little boy. I would walk, when I would walk by any church, I always made the sign of the cross. We're from the Holy Land. We lived in Israel. The Holy Land. I was born a block away from the house of Simon the Tanner. It's in the Bible. I went to school right across from his house. I was born a, a, literally a block away from where he was, where Peter had the vision. I was born a block away. I could have walked there in five minutes. But I did not know the Lord. But I knew everything about the Lord. I was the, the kid in, in, in catechism, I went to a Catholic school, that drew every scene of the New Testament in a little book, in order. I went from the, his birth to his death, and I took every beautiful part of his life and put it in a nice book myself. I was just 10 years old. And I love to know the history of my part of the world. And one day the Lord said something powerful to me. I'm sitting watching a historical program, and the Lord said, cancel the channel. I canceled it. He said, then, he said cancel cable. I canceled it. He said, cancel DirecTV. I canceled. For the last 10 years now, maybe more, 
I have not watched television. I have no TV networks to watch. Melanie challenged me about the same time to read my Bible three times a year. I took the challenge and I've been doing it ever since. And now I also decided to learn Hebrew. So I really wanted to know, wanted to know the Word of God. So I became a student of Hebrew University. And I was in class for three years. And I became a top student. And the professor told me I'm the number one student in reading Hebrew. And I love that. Today I can read you the Bible in Hebrew flawlessly. I wanted to know everything about God I could, I, I, I could discover. I began reading the historical books of Christianity. I began reading the early fathers and uh, the, uh, the great martyrs of Christianity. I, I read four times Fox's book of martyrs. I wanted to know everything about the faith. It changed my life. It began to enrich my life and walk. But during that whole time, this has been 10 years now. That was the, when I came to Ghana the first time, I wasn't in that place. Yes, I always loved the Lord and served him and walked with him. But now I'm in a different place to, completely. I'm not the same Ben him. That's why tonight I'm talking to you about this. I know many of you, you know, you want to be healed. Look, you're going to be healed like that. Let's receive the word. So I began to search within me, Lord, please help me die to self. I remember Catherine Kuhlman, she would talk about death all the time. When I would go to her early days, in, the, in my early, early days, when I was in my late teens, I was 19 years old and 20 years old when I would go and see Miss Kuhlman. And the first time I heard her, and I did not know what she meant. She said, and she was very dramatic, you have to die. You have to die. I had no clue what she meant. She said, Catherine Kuhlman dies a thousand deaths before I walk on that platform. I had no clue what she meant. Catherine Kuhlman died a long time ago. I had no clue what she meant. She talked about dying, dying. So I went home, I got on my knees. I said, dear Jesus, kill me. <laughs> I didn't know what she meant. I said, dear Jesus, just kill me. I have no clue what she's talking about. I, I don't know how to die, so please kill me. But now I know what it means. And I can put the puzzle together from Duplessis and after Duplessis and before Duplessis and since then and Catherine and Corrie ten Boom who talked about dying for the Lord. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Hate himself. If you don't hate your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your children, you cannot be mine. If you don't hate your own life too, you cannot be my disciple. It's impossible. And I'm glad they got it for you. If any man come after me that hate not his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and his own life. I did not understand that when I was saved. He is not telling you to dishonor your parents, the same God who said, honor your father and mother. But we have examples of what he meant when his mother Mary came to Galilee with his brothers and they said, your mother is out there. He said, who is my mother? Who is my mother? And my brothers. They who hear the word and do it. But on the cross, when he saw his mother, he said to John, take care of her. Balance. Balance. She could not interfere in the call of God on his life. She could not pull him away from where he ought to be and doing for the Lord. But he never stopped 
honoring his mother. His last request on the cross to John was, take care of her. Dying to self is daily. It's a daily death. You cannot be a conqueror in Christ Jesus without dying to self and dying to the world and dying to the flesh continually, continually. You know, people love preaching and talking about we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'm going to read for you some of the most beautiful scriptures in Romans 8 that you all know by heart. My favorite verse is Romans 8.32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God and makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. And then they jump to verse 37. In all these things were more than... Stop it! Don't miss verse 36. So they go from verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. And then they, they go, we are more than conquerors. But stop it! In verse 36 it says, Yet as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep to the slaughter. Then we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Of course, Jesus will never leave you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? None can. None can. It is true. It is real. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? No tribulation, no distress, no persecution, no famine, no kid, no nakedness, no power, all sort. Why? Because we're dead. A dead man is not affected by persecution. A dead man is not affected by tribulation. A dead man is not affected by distress or famine. A dead man is not affected by nakedness, peril, or sword. He is more than conqueror because he's dead. And when you are dead, then you can say, then and only then you can say, all these things are more than a conqueror through him who loved me. And then Paul declares this triumphant declaration. I'm persuaded that neither death or life or angels or principalities or things present or things to come or height or death or any other creature shall be able to separate me. Who's me? The dead from Christ Jesus, from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We have to die to self to become conquerors. We have to die to self so persecution will not affect us. Tribulation will not touch us. Peril or sword or hunger or nakedness will not affect our life. Because a dead man is not affected by these things that the world will come against us with. He's dead. And when you're dead, you're alive in Christ Jesus. Take your seats. So we embrace the cross. We die and we embrace, what do we embrace? The shame of the cross. When Jesus said yes to the cross, he was mocked, he was spat upon, he was whipped. On the way to Calvary, they were spitting upon him, mocking him. When you embrace the cross, the world will persecute you. The world will mock you. All that live godly will suffer persecution. But Jesus said, when, when they persecute you, rejoice, rejoice. <sighs> the wonder, the 
that Jesus was stripped and nailed to the cross naked for all to see. The wonder is not that the Son of God became obedient unto death, but he became obedient unto the death of the cross. Because was there ever a death more shameful? Embracing the cross is to embrace the offense of the cross. Galatians 5.11 talks about the offense of the cross. Put that on the screen for them. And brethren, and I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Yes, they will persecute you. Yes, they'll mock you. Yes, they'll, they'll accuse you falsely because you've accepted Christ Jesus as Savior. Because you denied the world and all that it offers you. You want no part of it. A soldier of Jesus should not entangle himself with the affairs of his life, said Paul to Timothy. A soldier of Jesus should not be entangled with the affairs of this life. We set our affections on things above. If you want to live a mature, powerful Christian life, begin to live for the next life in this life. Begin to live for the next life in this life. Don't wait to get to heaven and find out how much you missed on earth. Many believers are going to be, when they get to heaven, they're, 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 they're going to be ashamed of the fact they missed it on earth. So don't get to heaven and find out how much you missed down here. The journey begins today. Death to self begins here. Victory begins here. And the cross represents weakness. When you read Psalm 22, 14, and 15, it talks about his weakness on the cross. This is weakness. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like, it's like wax. It's melted in the midst. That's weakness describing Christ on the cross. Paul the Apostle talks about the weakness of the cross in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 3 and 4. That Jesus died in weakness. Hallelujah. Since you seek proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you it is not weak, but is mighty in you. Next verse, please. Oh, this is glorious. This is so glorious. Verse 4 declares... For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. And we also are weak in him. But what does it mean to be weak? It means we come to the end of our resources. We come to the end of our strength. We come to the end of ourselves to say, Lord, I can't live. Please live your life through me. I cannot conquer. Please conquer through me. I have no strength of my own. He giveth more grace, Jim. He giveth more grace. Play it for me. He giveth more grace. When the burden grows greater. Yeah. Sing it. He sendeth more love and power. When the labors increase. To added afflictions, he added his mercy. To multiply trials, his multiply peace. His love has, has no limit. limit. His grace, grace has, has no, no measure. His power has no boundaries. No, not to man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus. He giveth and, and giveth and giveth again. again. When we have reached the end of our endurance, 
And you know, this is exactly what I'm, I'm teaching about tonight. We come to that weakness of place, of weakness, and say, Lord, I cannot endure. I have no strength in my own. Let the Lord lead you. Keep playing, though. I'm almost done. It brings you to the end of your resources to total dependence on the Lord. So not only does it represent shame and persecution, and we embrace and rejoice when they mock us, persecute us, coming to the end of our strength and so, and so Lord, I'm so weak, I trust you to live your life through me. Give me your strength. When I'm weak, I'm strong. But it means death. It means death. The cross lies at the heart of the Christian message. The gospel was never intended to give you a spring cleaning. The gospel ne never came to brighten you up. The gospel never was preached to make you a little more like God or acceptable to God. The gospel came to finish you, to bring you to the cross. Why? So you can be a new creature in Christ Jesus. And when you die, oh Jesus, I worship you. Lift your hands and thank him, saints. When you make that decision to shut the world out, I'm not asking you to cancel cable or TV networks. That's your decision. But I made a decision to finish stronger than when I began. And I don't want this world to affect me or anything in it. I have no desire whatsoever for it. I lost my desire for what it offers. I've had opportunities in the last 50 some years of my life that nobody's had. I've learned that when God uses you, the devil will come to tempt you and offer you things. This may shock you. I have seen the devil twice. And I don't want to see him ever again. The first time he came, he came to kill me. I'll never forget when he appeared in my room with such anger. It was 1974. But the blanket of the Holy Ghost covered me. And I went to sleep. But then after the crusades began and the crowds came, he showed up one more time in my room. Now, if you don't believe that, that's your problem. I saw him like I see you. He said, I'll give you anything you want if you'll quit the ministry. And I screamed at him, no! You say, that happened to you? Oh, yes, it did. It was that same week a man offered me a position in Hollywood. He was a very famous producer. Used to come to our crusades. He looked at me one day and he said, I'll make you a big movie star. You don't need all this. I said, I have no interest in what you offer. He cussed me with the filthiest words I ever heard. I walked out of that room disgusted with his offer oh yeah some preachers have taken the offer that the world has offered them so they would not be persecuted so the world would talk well of them I have decided to follow Jesus there is no turning back though none go with me yet I will follow the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. There's nothing to turn to. To whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of life. 
To whom shall we go? In John 6, when they said, who can handle this? Who can handle what he said about his body and blood? He said to the apostles, will you also go? To whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of life. No, no, I will not finish as one defeated. I will not become a trophy of the devil. I will finish well. For I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning, no turning, no never turning back. I'm going to ask you to make the same decision. Your life belongs to Jesus. Without him, there is no meaning for life itself. It's better to have never been born than to live without knowing the Lord. You were not born to know your mom and dad or brothers and sisters. You were born into this world to meet the man, Christ Jesus. For the day will come, your mom will go, your dad will go, your brothers and sisters will be no more, your loved ones will be no more, but he'll always be there. He's the only one who said, I shall never leave you, nor forsake you. My mother would have loved to have said that. My father would have loved to have said that, but they knew they could not fulfill it. Only one will always be there. Only one loves you. Only one caresses your forehead when you're in trouble. Only one gives you comfort when you need it and strength when you need it. Only one will come when the others leave. He never leaves. Never leaves. Because he's Jesus. He'll never betray you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never forget you. You may forget him. He will never, ever, ever forget his own. Give him a chance. Give him your time. Come back to him. He wants you. He wants to trust you again. He wants to use you again. He doesn't trust many because not many are trustworthy. The eyes of the Lord go through and through throughout the whole earth to show himself strong for those who need and call on him. The time has come to surrender completely to the Son of God and say no to Satan and the world and everything that it offers. It's time to shut it out of your life, away from your life. It's time to get in the scriptures and get to know the blessing and the wealth of the honey in the Bible, the treasure in the Bible. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Psalm 19, the testimony of the Lord is sure, yeah. Making wise the simple. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. The testimony of the Lord is sure and true, enlightening the eyes. Lift your hands and thank Him. The commandments of the Lord is sure. It's, it's, it's just the Word of God. More to be desired are they than gold. Yet than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey. Go back to verse 7, my brother. The law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? Converting the soul. His testimonies are sure, making wise the simple. How about verse 8, my brother? Verse 8, please. The statues of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. That's, that's all I did. I just said, I'm going to go to the Word. Forget the world, and let's get the Word. So it says, come on, verse 8, the statues of the Lord are right, rejoicing. And my goodness, I've had more joy than I could ever talk about. 
the commandments of the Lord is pure. What? Enlightening the eyes. Look, look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. That's the Bible. More to be desired are they than gold. Lift, lift your hands. Yea, the much fine gold. Worthy more than the gold. Sweeter also than the honey. And the honey cold. Just gently please, Jim. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey. And the honeycomb. When you, when you read the Bible like I have been lately for the last 10 years at least now in my life, I got to a portion of Scripture one day. And, you know, I don't pray any, anymore my prayer list. I have no prayer lists. I have no prayer lists. They don't even work. I can pray my prayer list in 30 seconds. But when I'm in the Word, it triggers prayer. So I'm reading this. Jeremiah 3, 1. They say if a man put away his wife and she go from him, becomes another man's wife, shall he return to her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? Now, now let me stop here. Joshua, Pastor Joshua. In the Old Testament, Kiki, in the Old Testament, God said to Moses, he said, you tell Israel, if a man puts, puts away his wife or she leaves her husband and she marries another, to go back to her first husband would be an abomination. The land would be polluted. It was against the law against the law of Moses for a man to divorce his wife and then if she married another man to go back to her first husband. But I'm reading this one day and it shocked me. I said, Lord, you told Israel not to do that. Listen, listen. They say, what, what he means by they say is it's in the Old Covenant. They say if a man put away his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's, shall he return again to her? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? Well, that's what it says in the Old Testament. Oh, my. But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again to me, says the Lord. And I stopped. I said, Lord, you told Israel not to do this. You told your people, Israel, if a man divorces his wife or his wife divorces him and marries another man, she can't go back to her first husband. But you are God and you're telling Israel that they have married other husbands, but you want them back. I said, what kind of God are you? I said, Lord, you're amazing. What love is this? What mercy is this? That you want your people back? Even if they're polluted? That's what it says. That's what it says. I have decided to follow Jesus. You know why, huh? Because I've seen his love. I have decided to follow Jesus. Will you decide with me? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Sing it. 
the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, sing it, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning Though none go with me, yet I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, I will always follow. Lift both hands, no turning back. Tell it. My message is really quite simple. Yes, we're justified and we're free from the penalty of sin, but we must conquer to be free from the power of sin. We cannot disappoint Him anymore. We cannot grieve the Holy Spirit any longer. We cannot be holy on our own strength. Only He can live within you that holy life. Total surrender to the Lord. Embracing the cross and its persecution, mockery and shame. Coming to the end of yourself to say, Lord, I'm too weak to even know how to follow. Give me the strength and the will to walk with you. Help me die to the things of life and the world that you will be all my all in life and all. And I won't just sing. I won't just sing it. I'll mean it. I'll live it. I surrender all. I'll mean it. I mean it. You have no idea the peace I have found. Oh, the peace I have found in my soul. It doesn't mean the trials of life cease. They actually get worse. But peace. I like my hiding place. Where I open my Bible. And I'm gone. Into a haven of rest. place of such beauty and joy and contentment. I have felt many moments on platforms around the world where I thought my body would explode with joy. I have felt the power of God probably more than most people. But I have never known joy in my heart and peace in my soul as I do now. Because that you take with you to heaven. No, I have not made it yet. Because Paul the Apostle wrote, he didn't make it either in Philippians. He said, I count all but loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. He says this. He says, I can boast. Yes, he said, I've been circumcised. I'm of the stock of Israel. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As a Pharisee, I was blameless. I was so zealous, I persecuted the church. But what things were gained to me, those things I count but loss. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss. Why? That I might know the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, do count them but dung. 
that I may win Christ. Be found in him, not having my own righteousness, no, no, which is of the law, but that which is through faith, that righteousness which is of God by faith. Because all I want to know, I want to know him. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of what? His sufferings. I want to be made conformable to the image of his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. But I have not attained yet. I'm not there yet. But I follow after. If I may just apprehend that for which also I'm apprehended of Christ. He wrote those words, precious people of God, in prison. He was tied. He was apprehended by chains. Listen to the words. Listen to the words. He said, I want, I want that I may apprehend. I want to capture that for which I'm captured in Christ. Just like those chains have captured me, I want to capture him. I may capture and apprehend that for which I'm apprehended. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I will do, and I say the same, forgetting this, those things which are behind me, reaching forth to those things which are before me. I'm going to press toward the mark. I want a prize. He is my prize. The high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So as he said to us, I'll say to you, let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. If any, and if in anything you may be otherwise minded, God will reveal this to you too. And I believe God has revealed that to many of you here tonight. Let us walk by the same rule. Let's mind the same thing. Be followers of me. And mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Because he said, I'm writing you weeping. That there are enemies of the cross out there who want nothing to do with the cross. But we've decided we will carry the cross. Lift your hands to him. Shh. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast safe in the death of Christ my God. Thank you, Lord. See from his head and his hands and his feet sorrow and love flow mingled down the cross. See from his head. No, I can't. See from his head hands and feet sorrow and love flow mingled down did ever love and sorrow meet or have you ever seen composed so rich 
the crowd. And so we say today to you, Lord, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of glory he died my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride my Jesus I love thee I know thou art mine for thee all the follies of sin I reside my gracious redeemer my Savior, art thou, art thou, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis. I loved thee in life, I will love thee thee in death and praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath and say when the death do lies cold on my brow my brow if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Lift your hands to him. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because, sing for me, come on, Jim. In such a blessed way, and yes, I praise you, I lift you up, I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. We stand with eyes closed. Everyone standing, please. Everyone standing, please. Every eye closed. Make that commitment to Him. You sang it earlier, now in your heart say it to Him. I will not turn back, Lord. To whom shall I go? You have the words of life. You are my everything. You are my all. Just gently, Jim, please. Just heavenly sounds now. You are my everything. Yeah. Both great and small. You gave your life for me, made everything new. You are my everything. Lord, I love you. You are our everything. You are our all, all of us. You are our everything both great and small. You gave your life for every one of us, made everything new. You are our everything. Lord, we love you. 
Jesus. 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 There is something about your name. Tell him, saints. You're my master, Savior. Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain. Lift your hands and call his name. Jesus. Out loud. Jesus. Let all heaven, let the earth proclaim. And kings and kingdoms, they'll all pass away. But there's something about your name. Kings and kingdoms, they'll all pass away. There's something about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There is something about your name, Master. Savior, like the fragrance after the rain, lift his holy name, Jesus, 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 let all heaven, let the earth. If in the instruments, come on, Jim. And kings and kingdoms and all pass away. But there's something about Jesus. You're the sweetest name I know, and you're just the same. As your lovely name, that's the reason why we love you so. For Jesus, you're the sweetest name. Holy, holy, holy are. You Lord, holy, holy, holy are you Lord. The elders, the angels bow, the redeemed. Holy, holy, holy. coming from the throne. There are cries of adoration 
as men from every nation lift a voice to make his glory known. so glorious preparing us your temple we are born as living stones where you're enthroned as you rose from death and power come rise within our worship rise upon our praise let the hand that saw you raise clothe us in your glory Draw us by your grace You are Jesus So glorious Preparing us Your temple Born as living stones Where you're enthroned As you rose from death in power, come rise within our worship, rise upon our praise. Let the hand that saw your race please clothe us in your glory draw us by your grace oh the glory of your presence of your presence we are temple Give your reverence. Give you reverence. So rise. So rise to your rest and be blessed
Jesus. So glorious. Please prepare in us your temple. Born as living stones where you're enthroned. As you rose from death in power, come rise within our worship. Rise upon our praise. Let the hand that saw you reign clothe us in your glory draw us by your grace tell him oh the glory of your presence says, and I, John, I, John, was on the Isle of Patmos, and I turned to see the voice that spake to me, and I saw one standing in the midst of the candlesticks. whose eyes were like fire, who shone brighter than the sun, whose hair was white like wool. When I saw him, I fell as one who was dead. And he laid his hand upon me and said, Fear not, John. I'm the first and the last. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Our Savior. One of these days our eyes shall see Him. And our hearts will rejoice forever.
Everywhere, join hands together, but not in the aisles. Join hands together, please. Clear the aisles, gentlemen. Ushers, ushers, no. I want no, no one in the aisles. Clear the aisles, please. Such a mighty presence of God here. Lift your hands to heaven above as you join them together. Oh, Jesus. Your word declares, and suddenly there came from heaven the sound of a mighty rushing wind. It filled the house. Let the same wind of the Holy Ghost come into this room now. Touch your people now. Touch! 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 Everyone lift your hands and pray out loud in the Holy Ghost. In the Holy Ghost. Join hands right here quickly. There's a mighty anointing here. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Clear the aisles, clear the aisles, clear the aisles. Clear the aisles. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Clear the house, please. Join hands right here, please. Receive it, 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 receive it. Receive it, receive it, receive it, receive the anointing, receive the anointing, receive the anointing, receive the Holy Ghost. Receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it. Receive the anointing. All the pastors, all the preachers, get down here now. All full-time ministers, get down here now quickly. Everyone in ministry, get down here quickly. God, dear God, dear God, dear God. Here goes, here goes, here goes, here goes, here goes, here goes, the anointing, the anointing, the anointing, the anointing, the anointing, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Receive it, receive it, receive it, receive it, receive the Holy Ghost, receive the power of God.
Alright, so Joshua, come here quickly, please. and ask you for more. Much more. Much more. Much more than this. Let your fire, Lord, receive the anointing. It's here. This is the time to lift your hands and ask him for the biggest request you have. Ask him for the biggest request. Give him the biggest request. Hold nothing back. Don't limit him. Don't limit him. Such a moment will not come this way again. What is your cry? What is your request? Said the king to Esther. I'll give you half of my kingdom. How much more will the king of kings, our heavenly father, say to us? cheap words then as Sarah surely didn't mean it to say to Esther I give you half of my kingdom but our wonderful heavenly father says to us it is my pleasure to give you the whole kingdom not just half the kingdom there were the empty words of Isaiah a king of a nation that no longer exists. But our king, our king says, it is my joy, my pleasure to give you the kingdom, all of it. And Jesus said, for the kingdom of God dwelleth within you. So ask him. 
For one of these days, you'll judge angels. One of these days, you will rule the world with him. For the kingdom of this world shall be the kingdom of our God and of his Christ forever. And in Daniel it states, and the kingdom shall be the saints. For the saints of the Most High shall possess the kingdom of this world. But it goes beyond this world. Much further than this world. It's an eternal kingdom he gives us. For the asking. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow. But what do we get, Lord? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? More than just a kingdom. No. The greatest thing, now, my brothers and sisters, Dead in all you Lord. The greatest thing is to inherit Him. He is our inheritance. He is our inheritance. And we are His. To be one with Him. The one with the glasses, that one. There's a call on your life. There's a call on your life. I saw you last night. There's a blessed treasure inside of you. Use him, Lord. Please. Bring him closer. When I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your loveliness, Sanctify him unto your use. Don't let him lose not a moment of life to this world. I give his life to you as he gives his life himself to you. And I declare him to be your servant, your soldier your vessel as it stands and blesses your servant Joshua Dak and those around him. <sighs> Use him. Use him. These are men of honor Let them all be men and women of honor. We'll serve you faithfully, every one of them. Saints, what belongs to us is beyond the scripture. Young people, you sweet, wonderful people of God standing there, you young men and young women, what belongs to you is beyond comprehension or even explanation. That God should dwell in you and you in Him eternally. That He will be your inheritance 
and you will be his inheritance that you and him will be one united forever there will not be two of you there will be one of you just one in the Lord the Bible says even today he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit within your heart is the son of God through his Holy Spirit now before that it was your spirit but now it's the Holy Spirit your spirit is hiding in him because now we are hiding we're hidden in him there's not two in our hearts there's only one he that's joined to the Lord is one spirit the reason I'm calling you up is because I saw this man last night and the Lord spoke to me about him I don't even know his name I think I know his I think he told me I'm not sure no not him this man there it's Daniel isn't it yeah I sanctify you Daniel for the Lord's use for the rest of your days Every moment you live, every breath you take will be for His glory. You no longer belong to yourself or the world or your, even your own family. You are the Lord's treasure, the Lord's vessel, His own forever. His own forever. They are your own forever, Lord. They don't belong to themselves, nor the world, nor the natural families. They belong to you. Keep them as the apple of the eye. Hide them under the shadow of your wings. Protect them from the oppressors, their deadly enemies. For the rest of their life, let them live in that blessed secret place, your secret place. I pray no plague will come near them, not one. A thousand will fall at their side and ten thousand at their right hand. It will not come nigh them. With their eyes they'll behold. The reward of the wicked, they are yours. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you, people of God, all the days of your life. And you'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And today I bless you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon your life and give you peace for the rest of your days for the rest of your life now Lord I seal your blessings on their life on their destiny in you in Jesus name as I stood here tonight and I sensed his incredible sweet, tangible presence. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I was gone. I was, something happened to me physically, mentally earlier. And as that, that anointing began to sweep over my soul and your soul earlier, God sent me here for more than just ministering his word. I can tell you by the Spirit, a new mantle is coming on your life. Yeah. Don't lose it. Don't let anyone steal it. How many of you tonight sensed something come upon you? I did. I felt something on my head earlier. I felt a, a blessed, powerful force over my head. Did any of you feel the same? Wave if you did. 
I believe God is placing on you a new mantle. Lift your hands and thank Him. Just audibly thank Him. And the Lord is going to use you in a mighty way here in Ghana and beyond Ghana. So I had planned to teach tonight on embracing the cross. I did my job. And how many understood what I said? And how many will do it? You'll live it. You'll embrace the cross. That's it. And you will win over the power of sin. As you embrace the cross.